In the last few decades, researchers have discovered that the human proteome is vastly more complex than the human genome. Post-translational modification of proteins increases this functional diversity of the proteome, which is the entire set of proteins expressed by a genome at a certain time. The fact that there are way more proteins than there are genes demonstrates that single genes can encode for multiple different proteins. And the increased complexity of the proteome as compared to the genome is facilitated by many different mechanisms, including post-translational modifications, which help to regulate localization, activity, and interactions with other cellular molecules. These modifications can occur at any time during the life cycle of a protein. Many proteins are modified right after translation is completed, and these modifications help to mediate folding into proper conformation, increase the stability of the nascent protein, or help to localize this protein to distinct cellular compartments, like a shipping label. Other modifications occur after folding is completed and a protein has been localized to its proper cellular locale. These modifications serve to alter the biological activity of the protein, either by activating or inactivating catalytic activity, for example. Some other modifications serve as markers that target a protein for degradation. And besides chemical modifications, proteins can be modified via cleavage or proteolysis. The key thing to remember is that the proteome is dynamic and responsive to all sorts of changes in stimuli. And post-translational modifications are a common mechanism for regulating these cellular activities. Now, there are many, many types of post-translational modifications, so I'll go over only the most common ones here. And let's start with methylation. Methylation involves the transfer of one carbon methyl groups to amino acid side chains by methyl transferases using S-adenosyl methionine, or SAM, as the primary methyl group donor. This can neutralize a negative amino acid charge when bound to carboxylic acids and leads to increased hydrophobicity of the protein. A well-known use for methylation is epigenetic regulation of transcription. Histone methylation and demethylation can alter the availability of DNA for transcription. Another type of protein modification is acetylation, specifically to nitrogen atoms on a protein, so N-acetylation which occurs as a nascent protein is being translated. The N-terminal methionine on the growing polypeptide chain is cleaved by methionine aminopeptidase and then replaced by an acetyl group donated by acetyl-CoA via an enzyme called N-acetyltransferase. Up to 90% of eukaryotic proteins are acetylated this way, though the biochemical significance of this modification remains to be known. Acetylation also occurs on the lysine residues of histones via the action of histone acetyltransferases. And this is also used to alter transcription in a similar manner to that of methylation. The acetylation of histones helps to promote transcription by reducing the chromosomal condensation around these proteins. The next post-translational modification that can occur to proteins is called glycosylation. And it is one of the most significant types of post-translational modifications because it has implications on protein folding and conformation, distribution, stability, and also activity. Glycosylation involves the addition of a diverse array of sugar moieties and ranges from simple monosaccharide modifications of transcription factors to highly, highly complex branched polysaccharide modifications of cell surface receptors. These carbohydrates can be added to the nitrogen atom in the side chain of asparagine residues, those are N-linked, or to the oxygen atom in the side chains of serine or threonine residues, these are O-linked. These types of glycosylation changes, these types of glycosylation changes form major structural components of cell surface and secreted proteins. The next modification, lipidation, is a post-translational modification employed to target proteins to particular membrane-bound organelles, such as the endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus, or mitochondria. It is also used to target proteins to endosomes, lysosomes, and the plasma membrane. Two types of lipidation modifications are GPI anchors and S-palmitoylation. C-terminal glycosyl phosphatidyl inositol, or GPI anchors, help to tether proteins bound to the plasma membrane of the cell surface. 
These hydrophobic moieties are prepared in the endoplasmic reticulum where they are added to nascent proteins and used to localize cell surface proteins to cholesterol or sphingolipid rich areas in the plasma membrane. S. palmitoylation involves the addition of 16 carbon long palmitoyl groups to dilate side chains of cysteine residues. This modification adds a long hydrophobic chain that can be used in a similar manner as a GPI anchor. It helps to anchor proteins in the hydrophobic cell membrane. Next is ubiquitination, which is a protein modification used to target proteins for degradation. Ubiquitin is a polypeptide consisting of 76 amino acids that is attached to lysine residues of target proteins via the C-terminal glycine of ubiquitin. Polyubiquinated proteins are recognized by the 26S proteasome, which is an enzyme that catalyzes the degradation of the protein and the recycling of the ubiquitin. Next up is one of the most common post-translational modifications that you'll come across, and that's phosphorylation, which is a reversible modification that occurs principally on serine, threonine, or tyrosine residues, and is used to regulate proteins that play a role in a vast array of cellular processes, including signal transduction pathways, the cell cycle, cell growth, and apoptosis. Protein kinases are the enzymes that help facilitate the phosphate group transfer, and phosphorylases help to remove them. And lastly, enzymes called proteases may remove amino acids from the amino end of the protein or cut the peptide chain in the middle, a process known as proteolysis. One example of this is the peptide hormone insulin, which is cut twice after disulfide bonds are formed, and a propeptide is removed from the middle of the chain. The resulting protein consists of two polypeptide chains connected by disulfide bonds. Proteases also play roles in cell signaling, antigen processing, and apoptosis. Now, there are endless other types of post-translational modifications other than the ones that I've mentioned here. The key thing to remember is that once a protein is translated, <clears throat> now there are <clears throat> Now, there are endless other types of post-translational modifications than the ones I've mentioned here. So the key thing to remember is that once a protein has been translated, it can undergo a wide array of modifications that helps to alter the structure and the function of that protein according to the needs of the cell.